Moving on, we are going to look at the next section, looking at atoms that have formal charges and covalent molecules and ions. And you're going to be able to understand the meaning of atom formal charge and calculate the formal charge on each atom in a molecule or a polyatomic ion. Up to now, we've just been doing a lot of practice writing out the Lewis structures of molecules or polyatomic ions. You've seen these Lewis structures and you uh, are able to see how electron pairs are placed in these covalently bonded species, whether it's in a neutral molecule or those polyatomic ions. But now we turn to one of the consequences of the placement of electron pairs in this way. Individual atoms can have a small negative or positive charge or have no electric charge. And you've probably done some different arrangements that are a little bit different than mine. And we're gonna see how these arrangements can affect that. The location of a positive or negative charge in a molecule or an ion will influence, among some other things, but the, the influence the atom at which the reaction of which a reaction occurs. For example, does a positive H plus ion attach itself to the Cl or the O? of an ion in ClO minus. Well, to form hypochlorous acid, we would expect the H plus to attach to a more negatively charged atom. So we can predict this by looking at the atom and evaluating formal charges in molecules or ions. The formal charge is the electrostatic charge that would reside on an atom in a molecule or polyatomic ion if all bonding electrons are shared equally between pairs of atoms. The formal charge of an atom in a molecule or ion is calculated based on the Lewis structure of the molecule or the ion. We would calculate it by taking the number of valence electrons, and you'll see in your book it's abbreviated NVE for number of valence electrons, minus the sum of the lone pair electrons, or LPE, plus half of the however many are bonded electrons. Let's look at an example. Let's look at CH4, and let's calculate the formal charge of carbon in this compound. We need to take the number of valence electrons for carbon, which we know as four. That's our NVE, number of valence electrons is four. We're going to minus, we need to sum up our lone pair electrons. And if you look around carbon, there are no lone pairs. And then we need to do half of how many of the electrons around carbon are bonded. Well, we've got two, four, six, eight. So what's half of eight? Four. So four minus four is zero. So there is no formal charge on carbon. Let's calculate it for the hydrogens. Now all of these hydrogens are the same. How many lone, or how many uh, valence, the number of valence electrons hydrogen has is one. So we're going to minus the number of lone pairs that hydrogen has, none, plus one half of how many bonded electrons does hydrogen have? Two. One half of two is one. One minus one is zero. So there is a zero formal charge on hydrogen as well. Let's look at another example. This also pretty much tells me since I have everything as neutral here, that ions are not going to be attracted. Positive or negative ions are not going to be attracted to any part of this compound. Let's look at the formal charge of carbon monoxide. We have CO. Now, if we were to go back and think about how we drew CO in the last lecture, carbon we knew had four valence electrons and oxygen had six. So there was 10 electrons that we were taking into consideration when we were making this compound. And then we drew carbon with a triple bond, two, four, six for carbon plus the lone pair is eight. And then if I look at oxygen, that triple bond is six plus two is eight for oxygen. So that was tricky to write it. But now let's calculate and see what the formal charges of each atom. So let's do carbon first. 
we just told said that there was four for carbon and six for oxygen. That's the number of valence electrons. Now we need to minus and look at lone pairs. Yes, oxygen had two, carbon had two. So we have two plus half of how many were bonded? Well, they're the same for both. Two, four, six were bonded. So everything here is the same, but the difference is that carbon started with four valence electrons, oxygen started with six valence electrons. So four minus two plus three is five, four minus five is negative one. So this carbon formal charge on carbon is a negative one. And on oxygen, we did six minus five to give us plus one. So we can see how this would be slightly, the formal charge on my carbon, negative one, so it would be slightly attractive to a positive ion on a different compound. And same with this one, this is the positive side, so it's gonna be slightly attracted to a negative um, terminal. Note that the sum of the formal charges on the atoms in a molecule must equal zero. The sum of the atoms in an ion equals whatever the charge of that ion is. So if we go back and look at this last example, positive one, or I'm sorry, negative one and a positive one equals zero. If we look at the example before that, this was zero overall, so that didn't matter. So we just covered this first and second one. The, well, the first one, the most plausible Lewis structure is the one with no formal charges, with the formal charges of zero on all atoms. That would be the structure that would most likely occur. Where formal charges are required, they should be as small as possible. And negative formal charges should appear on the most electronegative atoms. For example, fluorine, we know, is the most electronegative element there is, right? So we would not expect a formal charge of a plus one near a fluorine. That probably would be unlikely. Adjacent atoms in a structure should not carry formal charges of the same sign. We don't want two negatives near each other. That would not likely occur. Formal charges on the atoms in a Lewis structure must total to zero for the molecule and to the net charge of the polyatomic ion. So NH4 plus ammonium, the ammonium ion, should be a plus one charge when everything's added up. Consider the hypochlorite ions. Looking at oxygen to find its formal charge, we know that oxygen has six valence electrons. Then we're gonna subtract my lone pair electrons. Oxygen has two, four, six here. Six plus Half of however many is bonded. We know that we have two bonded here. Half of two, so six plus one is seven. Six minus seven gives me a formal charge of oxygen of negative one. Now looking at chlorine, you know chlorine has seven valence electrons. Again, there's two, four, six lone pairs and one bond coming off of chlorine. So half of two is one. Six plus one is seven. Seven minus seven is zero. So there's a zero net charge on the chlorine side and a negative one on the oxygen side. And remember, if it's not equaling zero, we need to equal what our ion charge is. Again, we made this compound, this Lewis structure, earlier in the lesson by taking chlorine and saying, okay, chlorine has seven valence electrons, oxygen has six, we have a negative one ion, so we need to add one more. So seven to seven is 14. And we took chlorine and we took oxygen. And we said, all right, chlorine has one. There's got to be at least one bond between them. One, two, three, four, five, six. And this was chlorine seven. Oxygen. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Chlorine is happy. Oxygen has one, two already. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now let's count our electrons. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen. And we know that this was a negative one charge. So to find that formal charge that we just did by taking valence electrons minus 
the lone pair electrons plus the bonded electrons, we found that oxygen had a formal charge of negative one on this end, and the chlorine had a zero formal charge. Calculate the formal charges for the atoms of the ClO3 minus. So looking at the ClO3 minus, calculate the formal charges of oxygen and chlorine. Hopefully you were able to find that oxygen and go, okay, yep, oxygen has six valence electrons. Find the chlorine. Know that chlorine has seven valence electrons. So six minus, there are six electrons in the lone pairs around each oxygen, plus one half of each oxygen has one bond, which is two. So six minus, six plus one is seven. Six minus seven, the oxygens all have a negative one formal charge. Now let's look at chlorine. Chlorine we know has seven valence electrons minus Chlorine has two lone pair, or two, yep, two electrons that are in lone pair, so two plus half of six. It has one, one, two, three, four, five, six electrons that are in bonds. So two plus three is five. Seven minus five is plus two. So when I have a positive two and negative one, negative two, negative three, positive two minus three gives me a net ionic charge of negative one, which is what that ion is. Next, why don't you draw the structures for Cn minus and SO3 two minus and calculate the formal charges on each atom. First, I drew the Cn minus. We knew that carbon has four valence electrons, nitrogen has five, there's a negative one, which means one extra electron, which is a total of 10. Drew it. Carbon needed eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight for the triple bond. Nitrogen also needed eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And when we totaled it up, we've got two, four, six, eight, ten electrons. Now to find the formal charge, carbon. We're going to take number of valence electrons. Minus lone pairs. I'm actually going to do nitrogens at the same time. We know that nitrogen started with five. Minus. They each had two lone pairs. Plus half of. They each had a triple bond that they shared. So half of six, which is three. Half of six, which is three. So five minus five, nitrogen had a no net charge. Four minus five, the carbon had a negative one charge. And again, it would equal zero, except for this compound has a negative one charge. So the formal charge on carbon is a negative one in this case. Looking at SO3, two minus, I calculated that each O was Six valence electrons times three, so that was 18. S contributed six, and then we added two more because it was a negative two charge, so we needed 26 electrons. Each oxygen, of course, needed eight, so two, four, six, plus the bond is eight, so eight, six, and 24. And sulfur was sitting in the middle with only three bonds, which was six, so we needed to add the lone pairs for sulfur. Now let's calculate the formal charges. Looking at sulfur, we said that it had six valence electrons minus the number of lone pairs. There was only one lone pair, so two electrons there, plus half of bonded, two, four, six, half of six, which is three. So two plus three is five. Six minus five is negative one. So my sulfur has a negative one formal charge. Now let's look at the oxygen. 
oxygen we know had six valence electrons also minus how many lone pairs did each oxygen have two four six plus half of there was only one each oxygen only had one bond so half of two so six plus one is seven six minus seven is negative one each oxygen negative one negative one negative one and actually now I'm noticing my goof. Good thing I looked back, I thought that's too many negatives. Six minus five, because half of six is three plus two is five. Six minus five is positive one. That would make more sense here. Positive one. Therefore, I have one, two, three negatives, three negatives, and a positive one. So negative three plus positive one gives me my overall ion of negative two. Let's look and compare formal charges and oxidation numbers for hydroxide, OH. Again, to draw this Lewis structure, oxygen has six valence electrons, hydrogen has one, and we know that it's a negative one charge, so it's got to add an extra electron, so we got to account for eight. Again, we know oxygen has one, two, three, four, five, six. Hydrogen has one. So we know that we have a bond right here. And we know that we have that extra, so we need to have four pairs. Well, there's one, two, three. We need to have an X, our extra electron added there. I'm gonna draw that nicer. Here we go. So we have our one, two, three, four pairs of electrons. Everybody's happy, oxygen has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Hydrogen has two. We have a negative one charge. Now let's calculate the formal charges. Oxygen has six valence electrons minus, there's two, four, six that are in lone pairs, plus half of two in the bonded. So Half of two is one plus six is seven. Six minus seven is negative one for oxygen. So we have a negative one charge on my oxygen side. And if I look at hydrogens, we had one valence electron minus zero lone pairs plus half of, there are two electrons in that bond that hydrogen is attached to the oxygen, so half of two which is one, one minus one is zero. Hydrogen's formal charge is zero. And if we look at both, I've got a negative one and a zero to give me that overall. Charge of negative one for that compound. But now let's think and look back to what we know about oxygen on the periodic table. Didn't we say that oxygen had an oxidation number of negative two, and then hydrogen was positive one. Notice how the oxidation numbers are different from the formal charges that we just calculated. So here's the difference. Oxidation numbers are determined by assuming that the bond between a pair of atoms is ionic, not covalent. So for OH minus hydroxide, this means that the pair of electrons between O and H is located fully on O. So the O atom now has eight valence electrons instead of six and grabbing two more to have that charge of negative two. The hydrogen atom now has no valence electrons and a charge of plus one. Again, if this was an ionic compound, the hydrogen would be giving away its electrons, not sharing it with the oxygen. So formal charges and oxidation numbers are calculated for different purposes. Oxidation numbers allow us to follow the changes in redox reactions. And formal charges provide insight into the distribution of charges in molecules and polyatomic ions. Why don't you try pausing the recording and try to determine the formal charges for the formate ion as below. Calculate this charge on this oxygen for the carbon and for this oxygen.
Hopefully you're able to go, okay, oxygen is six minus four in lone pairs plus four in the bond. So half of that is two. So six minus six would give me zero. Looking at carbon, carbon has four valence electrons minus, and then we need to add together how many lone pairs? Zero. And it's got two, four, six, eight. So half of eight is four. Four minus four is zero. And if we look at this oxygen, oxygen, we know it, six valence electrons minus, and then we need to add up half of the two bonded, so one, um, plus two, four, six. Seven. So we should get six minus seven to get negative one. How about this one? What is the formal charge of the S atom in SO3? Take a second to draw it. And hopefully you got plus two. What about the N atom in nitric acid? And the formula is HNO3, if you couldn't remember. So draw this out, find the formal charge on the N atom. I hope you got plus one. How about the formal charge on the S atom and SO3 two minus? I think we might have done that one earlier. Hopefully you got plus one. All right, now after all of that practice of checking to make sure that every Adam was happy with having eight and meeting that octet rule. And now I'm going to tell you that there's some exceptions to it. So the vast majority of molecular compounds and ions obey the octet rule, but there are exceptions. These include molecules and ions that have fewer than four pairs of electrons on a central atom. Those that have more than four pairs and those that have an odd number of electrons. So let's look at some examples, but for example, we're gonna look at like odd numbers, NO, less than an octet would be BF3, and then there's more than an octet. Let's look at an example where a compound has fewer than eight valence electrons, boron trifluoride, or boron trihydride. So BH3, for example. You know, boron, if we look at it on the periodic table, will have three valence electrons. And hydrogen has one, and there's three of them, so this will equal six total electrons. So we make boron, hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. And so we will look to see, are there six, two, four, six? Yes, we are done. This is a trigonal planar molecule and everybody's full and happy. There's a bond angle between all of these of 120 degrees and that's just the way it is. So this is just one example of a molecule that does not obey the octet rule. So boron is a common atom that only allows for, since it has three, so there's six electrons surrounding it. The other example, like I mentioned previously, is boron trifluoride. Again, boron is happy with just two, four, six. Um, boric acid, another one where we, we could look at this and look at this oxygen, for example, and say two, four, six, eight. This oxygen has two. This oxygen has eight. Eight. This fluorine has eight. But boron is one of the exceptions where it's full with six. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of borax. Borax is a common mineral used in soaps. I use, I'm, I use it to make my homemade laundry soap. But the anion has two boron atoms surrounded by four electron pairs and two boron atoms surrounded by only three pairs. I thought this was an interesting video in the text to kind of show the reaction with BF3 boron trifluoride and NH3. And as you can see, we have boron trifluoride fluoride has eight 
each of the fluorides is found in the octet rule. We know boron does not, but it can still form an octet. And here's an example of how it does. Boron trifluoride is a Lewis acid because it has a deficiency of electrons. Ammonia acts as a Lewis base by donating its lone pair of electrons into BF3's vacant valence orbital. The product of this Lewis acid base reaction is a single molecule with a new bond, called a coordinate covalent bond, because both the electrons for the bond come from only one species. And this coordinate covalent bond is, uh, in Lewis structures, it's often symbolized by an arrow that points away from the atom that's donating the electron pair. So similar to when we were doing the, showing our double bonds where uh, the oxygen had to donate the, its, its lone pair electrons to form a bond so that everybody was happy. So that is something that happens, a coordinate covalent bond um, when two different molecules are forming together, especially with boron who is lacking, uh, is lacking electrons. Now, there are also compounds in which an atom has more than eight electrons. Elements in the third or higher periods can form compounds and ions in which the center element can be surrounded by more than four electron pairs. And there's an example, a picture I'm gonna show you here in just a second. Here's also a little video to just kind of explain and I'll talk about it more in just a second. Now there's some other molecules that have more than eight electrons. On a periodic table, the second row elements that you'll see often is carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. These electrons, um, excuse me, not electrons, but these atoms cannot have more than eight electrons. So they cannot have an expanded octet. However, they can have an incomplete octet. It is possible. Now the elements below them, for example, like silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, these elements, they can have what is known as the expanded octet. They can have more than eight electrons. The reason why nitrogen can have more than eight is because nitrogen is in the second row. And in the second row, you have the 2s sublevel and you have the 2p sublevel. Notice that in the second energy level, the maximum number of electrons is eight. So that's why second row elements cannot have more than eight electrons. It's just not possible. Phosphorus is in the third row. So in the third energy level, you have the 3s sublevel, the 3p sublevel, and the 3d sublevel. So therefore, in the third energy level, you can have up to 18 electrons. And that's why elements like phosphorus, sulfur, and chlorine, they can have expanded octets. So if they're the center atom, they can have more than eight electrons. Sometimes you might see them have 10, sometimes even 12. So just keep that in mind. So any... So here are some examples of those hypervalent compounds where the central atom exceeds an octet. And again, if you looked at your periodic table and you looked at group four, which was um, silicon, germanium, so we can see that we can make SIF5, and here's what it looks like. We know that silicon has four valence electrons, but it's able to make one, two, three, four, five bonds. Phosphorus, we know, has five um, valence electrons, and so one, two, three, four, five, it's forming five bonds, but notice that because it's got five bonds, it actually has 10 um, it's formed, it's extended its octet, so it doesn't have eight, it's got 10. And same with uh, sulfur, we can see that it has one, two, three, four, five, again, 10, chlorine, two, four, six, eight, 10, and xenon, two, four, six, eight, 10. And anyways, here's just several examples where we are not following the octet rule and we have more um, electrons surrounding it. So these are referred hypervalent And again, only elements of the third and higher periods in the periodic table form compounds and ions in which an octet is exceeded by the central atoms. The second period elements, boron, 
carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine are restricted to the maximum of eight electrons because they're in the second row. They can only have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, so that 2s2, 2p6, is, they're limited to eight. This leads to our next section, looking at molecular shapes. And our goal for this section is to be able to use the Vesper theory, or we'll get into that in a second, the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory to predict the shapes of simple molecules and polyatomic ions and to understand the structures of more complex molecules. So fluid structures show how atoms are connected in molecules and polyatomic ions. We've just been doing a whole lot of Lewis structures. However, they do not show three-dimensional geometry, which is often crucial to molecular function. And for that reason, we want to take the next step, the Lewis structures to predict three-dimensional structures. Vesper, or valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, is a method for predicting the shapes of covalent molecules and polyatomic ions. It's based on the idea that bond and lone pair electrons in the valence shell of an element repel each other and seek to be as far apart as possible. Think of having two magnets of the opposite side, or the same side, I guess, so two negatives repelling one another to be as far away from each other as they can. The positions assumed by the bond and lone electron pairs define the angles between bonds to surrounding atoms. Vesper is remarkably successful in predicting structures of molecules and polyatomic ions of main group elements. So like I said, the electron domains repel each other, so the space between is maximized. To have a sense of how the valence shell electron pairs determine structure, if we were to blow up several balloons of the same size, imagine that each balloon represents an electron cloud. When two, three, four, five, or six balloons are tied together at a central point, which represents the nucleus and the core electrons of that central atom, the balloon naturally form the shapes shown here. These geometric arrangements minimize interactions between the balloons and are the same as the arrangements of electron pairs that are observed in molecules. This shows us that if we have two balloons, again, tied at that central, we're gonna see a linear molecule. Three, we're gonna see a trigonal planar molecule. Four, we see a tetrahedral. And four would be similar to if we drew a compound like this, CH4. That would be like our tetrahedral. Trigonal bipyramidal, if I had five balloons, one, two, and then three, four, five. So almost a trigonal planar with a linear going up and down. And then octahedral, where I had four, so um, like a tetrahedral, but then a linear going up and down. So moving on from the balloon picture, we can see linear as being having the central atom and then the two on the other side, like BEF2, beryllium difluoride, and I have a bond angle of 180 degrees. Think straight across because a circle is 360, so half of that is 180. A trigonal planar, like BF3, where I have three pairs of electrons, one, two, three, coming off of that central atom. So I have a bond angle of 120 degrees. And I'm at, I mean, this is kind of that three-dimensional look. Tetrahedral, like CF4, we have four pairs of electrons. Five pairs of electrons, we're gonna get a trigonal bipyramidal shape. Six pair of electrons, like SF6. Again, this is that octahedral shape. So like I said earlier, looking at CH4, when we draw it flat on the paper and we draw it like this, like a T, we can look at this and go, oh yeah, the bond angle is 90 degrees. But if we were to add everything up, add all of those four angles together, we would see that 90 degrees times four would, would be 
would be 30, 360. So the Lewis structure actually suggests that the molecule is flat. But experimentally, they have found that the uh, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen bond, so HCH doing this, are actually 109.5 degrees. So if that's the case, the molecule can't be flat and planar because 109 times 4 is a 438 degrees. So if it's not flat, it must be, we take our Lewis structure, our CH4, and then we draw it in 3D. So we're able to make this each bond angle 109.5 degrees. So the molecular geometry is tetrahedral. The hydrogen atom fit at the corners of, the reg of a regular tetrahedron shape with the carbon at the center. So try writing out the Lewis structure of SiCl4 and come back and predict what shape it would be. Well, hopefully you were able to draw this Lewis structure and predict that this is going to be a tetrahedral structure, 109.5 degrees for those angles. How about predicting the shape of CH2Cl2? So hopefully after you drew out the Lewis structure for CH2Cl2, you got something that looks like this, and then, of course, we're going to be able to look at this and go, oh, well, that's going to be a tetrahedral also where the bond angle will be close to 109.5. It won't be perfect because there is a little bit of difference between the H's and CL's. That leads us to moving on, looking at central atoms with single bond pairs and lone electrons. So to see how lone pairs affect the geometry of a molecule or a polyatomic ion, we need to go think back to the balloon models. If you assume the balloon represents all the electron pairs in the valence shell of the central atom, the model predicts the electron pair geometry of the molecular atom. The electron pair geometry is the geometry assumed by all the valence electron pairs around a central atom, meaning both bonds and lone pairs. This is different from the molecular geometry which describes only the geometry of the central atom and the atoms directly attached to it just by bonds, not thinking about lone pairs. It's important to recognize that lone pairs of electrons on the central atom occupy spatial positions, but their location is not included in the verbal description of the shape or the molecule. So let's look for example. We're going to use the VSEPR model to predict the molecular geometry and bond angles in NH3 right here. If we were to draw it on the Lewis structure, we see that there are four pairs of electrons surrounding the central nitrogen atom. We can even go, oh yep, yeah, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Each hydrogen has two. Everything's happy. We can draw this piece of cake. There are three bond pairs, one lone pair of electrons. So the predicted electron geometry is tetrahedral. The molecular, molecular geometry, though, is trigonal pyramidal because that describes the location of the atoms. So notice that if I looked at electron pair, I would go, yep, I've got one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, that's tetrahedral. But remember, there's not an atom up there, but those electrons still push all these others down. The nitrogen atom is at the apex of the pyramid. The three hydrogen atoms form the trigonal base. So what is it actually? The molecular geometry is trigonal pyramidal. So trigonal, one, two, three, and it is like a pyramid, but it is not tetrahedral. There's not that actual atom up here at the top. Let's look at this example. Here we have three different examples of methane, ammonia, and water. All have four electron pairs around the central atom and have a tetrahedral electron pair geometry. If I were to draw CH4C with four H's around it, 
tetrahedral. If I were to draw ammonia, NH3, there's one, two, three H's around it, but there's also a lone pair up here. So you would, again, think, oh, tetrahedral, but there's only three atoms. It's trigonal pyramidal. This one up here is lone pair. It pushes those three down still, so it gives you an idea that this is going to be a trigonal pyramidal. And then if we look at water, water also, this oxygen has two lone pairs pushing these H's again further away. So it's a bent molecule. Try these two. What are the shapes of the ions, hydronium ion H3O plus and ClF2 plus? If we look at the Lewis structure of H3O plus, I would have O with three H's around it. I would have a lone pair on my oxygen, and it's a plus one charge. If I looked at my geometry, again, I would have one, two, three, four surrounding it. It would look, it would seem like it would be tetrahedral. The molecular geometry, though, again, that oh, uh, the lone pair is up there. there. It's not actually an atom up there. So I would have a trigonal pyramidal shape. If I looked at ClF2 plus my Lewis structure, if I drew it, it would look probably something like this. Maybe bent if you did a 90 degree look. So maybe you started linear, maybe you were bent at 90 degrees. Uh, maybe you were straight up and down. But if I did this uh, electron pair geometry, it would be a tetrahedral because I've got two lone pairs, two bonds. So that would be like, okay, yeah, there's four. Um, things coming out of four appendages coming out of my chlorine, it's tetrahedral, except for there's actually two, and then those lone pairs are really pushing those fluorines close together. So we actually have a bent or an angular um, molecule here. So how do we predict molecular shape? Write out the Lewis structure, count the number of electron domains around that central atom, describe the geometry in terms of the arrangement, and then remember the double and triple bonds are counted as one domain in determining the molecular shape. For the Vesper model, multiple bonds, again, count as one effective electron pair. Those lone pairs require more room. Think of lone pairs as space hogs. They take up a lot of space and they push the other stuff closer together. So they require more room than bonding pairs and tend to compress the angles of the other bond angles. So this leads us into the next part where central atoms with more than four valence electron pairs. What structures are observed at the central atom has five or six electron pairs, some of which are lone pairs? Well, a trigonal bipyramidal, which is this guy, structure has two sets of positions that are not equivalent. The positions in the trigonal plane lie in the equator of an imaginary sphere around the central atom. And we can kind of see that imaginary sphere. Think of a circle going around this straight up and down axis. This is our equatorial positions. The north and south poles of this representation are called the axial positions. So this and this are axial positions. Each equatorial atom has two neighboring groups, our axial atoms, at 90 degrees. And each axial atom has three groups. So here's our um, group here. Here's our three around it. If the lone pairs are present in the valence shell, they require more space. In this case, we don't have any lone pairs. Here is an example of having lone pairs. So I have um, SF4. Sulfur has six valence electrons, and each fluorine atom needs one electron to complete the octet. So I've got one, two, three, four. And to give my sulfur the octet, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. For sulfur, each F has its octet. Um, so as we can see here, this forms what's called a seesaw. This is our space hogging lone pair 
So here we have our axial and then the other two. So it looks like kind of a seesaw. I think of a childhood seesaw where this, this is the one side of the teeter-totter and this is the other side of the teeter-totter. And this is called a trigonal bipyramidal. We can also have an octahedron, an octahedral shape with six bond pairs with no lone pairs. Five bond pairs with one lone pair is called a square pyramidal. A square planar, we have four bonded pairs and two space hog lone pairs. Here's an example of octahedron when I have S, F, 6. We can see our, these are all at 90 degrees, makes an octahedral shape. So why don't you take a second and see what the shape of I, Cl4 minus ion would look like. Draw it as your Lewis structure and then take a guess on what the molecular geometry would be. So hopefully you saw that ICL4 would look something like this where we would go, okay, these lone pairs are those space hogs. So they're gonna be opposite of one another. They're pushing everything to the side. And therefore it's going to be square planar. How about this one, ICL2 minus? Draw that Lewis structure. What shape would that be? And hopefully you got to this, which would be trigonal bipyramidal, right? That's what it would look like if we drew it. And so the molecular geometry is actually linear because I have just my I and two chlorines and all of these space hogs are pushing everything around that um, center point. So these are 180 degrees from each other. Let's try a couple of questions. Based on the Vesper theory, which of the following corresponds most likely to the geometry of sulfur dichloride? So why don't you attempt to draw the Lewis structure for SCL2 and see what might become of that. What shape would it be? If we were to draw it out, we would get this because sulfur we know has six valence electrons, one, two, three, four, so two lone pairs and then two bonded pairs. And so those lone pairs are space hogs and they're going to push those two chlorines closer together, the lone pairs are going to take up more room. So it would be bent with the angle being less than that 120, so it's got to be about that 109.5. What about this one? A certain molecule has five bonding electron groups and the molecular geometry is linear. So how many lone pairs are present on the central atom in this molecule? The answer should be three. How about this one? If we have a molecule that has six binding electron groups and the molecular geometry is square pyramidal, how many lone pairs are present on this central atom? There would be one. What is the CLBCL angle in BCL3? So try drawing it out first and figuring out what that angle would be. And it should be 120 degrees because boron does not have those lone pairs that's space hogging. In dimethyl ether, the HCH bond, so hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen, this bond right here, or this bond, or this bond angle, or this bond angle is blank and the COC angle right here is approximately blank. They would both be about that 109.5. How about this? In I3, what would that angle be? And it's got to be 180 degrees. How about this one? Which shape, which geometry would best be represented by CLF2 plus? 
And hopefully if you drew it out, those space hogs you would see would push those two Fs um, down at a bent angle. How about this one, IF2 minus. And we can see if we drew this out that we would see the molecular geometry would be linear. And just to kind of show that thought process, we can go back to earlier when we had this, and this is in your text as well, where IF2, in this case, we have two bonding pairs and three lone pairs. We can see right around our central atom, one, two, three lone pairs, so it's gotta be a linear geometry. And this is looking at five electron pairs. And when we, when we look at that, we look around the central atom and we would say, here's one, two, three, four, five. So we would look here and say, well, what, what combination of those five? Two bonding pairs, three lone pairs, two bonding and three lone pairs would be linear. If it was three bonding pairs and two lone pairs, we would, could see that there, we would have a T shape and so on. So we wanna go back and always look at this to refer to.